your food will be will be getting burned. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, while we wait for others to join, uh, it's going to be a short session today, um, kind of a preamble to the ECG core content class. Um, a general overview on the pre-test submissions show that uh, it seems people are struggling with ECG. So we're going to start by running down on the ECG quiz. Um, we'll kind of have a group discussion and um, um, I would like it to be interactive and um, I'll be happy to have you drop your answers in the chat box uh, because it's a lot easier uh, for me to understand how you looking at the question and I can assist you with the techniques, the skills you would need to use on the real NCLEX. Okay, so we're gonna kick off with the first quiz uh, on the question you attempted. A client's telemetry monitor displays ventricular tachycardia. Upon reaching the client's bedside, which action should the nurse take first? Um, again, just to be clear, I have written the NCLEX. Um, no one has been charged a fee for this class. So it's, it's of your own best interest to try to build up on your knowledge uh, so that it doesn't look like I'm wasting my time. Um, so again, when I ask for answers, I would like that you contribute. Uh, if I ask you to unmute yourself and speak up, there is no harm in uh, asking a question for something you don't understand. Um, and one thing again I need you to understand is I, I went into the hall uh, to write the NCLEX praying for ECG questions, praying for pharmacology questions. And honestly, I did not get one ECG question on my NCLEX test day. I was like, is it that these people know that's where my strong skill is? How come? I thought everybody says they get ECG. I did not get one single ECG when I wrote the NCLEX. But again, we need to cover all of the basics just in case you get an ECG question or you get a couple of them on the NCLEX. And again, it's about technique on the NCLEX. People read and read and read. I'm reading every day. You are cramming, you're memorizing. It's all about technique. Um, again, I tell people, how well do you know to use the decision tree on the NCLEX? Because for me, that's what worked for me. People say you or people say they, they somebody said she has read Sundays from beginning to end, I'm like, blood of Jesus, how possible is that? So you, you need to study smart, not study hard, reading from morning to night. It's all about the technique. Because if I look at this question right here before me, let me say, for example, I did not know that ventricular, I, I didn't know what ventricular tachycardia was. But because I know to use my decision tree, I can categorize all of these options as implementation answer choices. Even without knowing what ventricular tachycardia is, I don't know what I should do first, but because I know that the priority, the priority action for a nurse on the NCLEX is to carry out assessment. And number four is my easy answer. So there's no way I'm failing priority questions on the NCLEX because I know that 
the, the, the first step in the nursing diagnosis is assessment. Again, they've told me the, the ECG, the telemetry monitor is showing ventricular tachycardia. And what should be my first answer? What should be my first uh, action? Again, do I need to do something or do I need to assess? That's what you need to ask yourself on the NCLEX. Look at it. Look at the scenario they've presented to you. Ask yourself, do I need to do something or do I need to assess? Because uh, if, for example, um, my child comes into the room and tells me, ah, I hit my leg on the stone, I won't just rush and start bandaging the, the, his feet, uh, putting cold compress on it, uh, calling the doctor, calling the hospital. No, I would like to at least look at my child's leg. And that's how practical the NCLEX is. Sometimes I look at some questions and I'm like, are these guys thinking we are fools or something? Because it's obvious there. I'm not just going to run and start treating his feet. Rather, I would do what a normal person would do, which is to assess for that, which is to look at the leg. Ah, come here. What happened to your leg? Where did you hit your leg? Well, what did you feel when you hit your leg? You know, that's the assessment there. I'm not ever going to choose an implementation option, most especially if my patient is stable. That's how you want to go on the NCLEX. Most people think it's about reading all day, memorizing and cramming. No, it's, it's basic techniques. For me now, I don't need to waste my time on this question. But for someone else, they are already, uh, they are already scared. I have ventricular tachycardia. What am I supposed to do? Maybe if I call a code, if I don't call a code, the patient will die. I need to, what's even cardioversion? I don't even know what cardioversion is. Do I need to, no. It's about using those techniques on the ankle. It's as simple as that. Again, you, you might not, like now, we don't even need to know what, um, we don't even need to know what ventricular tachycardia or cardioversion. Again, do I need to assess or do I need to implement? Just to add, even though you can use this technique to get the right answer, but again, I would like to add, with ventricular tachycardias, you must always remember that your patient can present with a pulse. He may have ventricular tachycardia and present with a pulse. He might come in with ventricular tachycardia and he doesn't have a pulse. And the management for both of them is different. Because if he has a ventricular tachycardia and he has a pulse, that's fine. We can manage him for ventricular tachycardia, a heart rate that is fast. But again, if he came in with ventricular tachycardia and he did not have a pulse, then that is no longer a ventricular tachycardia. That becomes a pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Again, if you've attended any of our BLS or ACLS classes, this is what we sing every day. If your client presents with a pulseless ventricular tachycardia, that is a shockable rhythm. You need to shock the hell out of this patient. Remember, there are only two shockable rhythms. One would be your ventricular fibrillation, and the other would be, this is the one we are referring to now, which is your pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Again, something else I would like to mention on this course. There's somebody seated at his screen, and he's busy. He has planned to snap all the slides on the screen. I can assure you, at the end of this presentation, you would have 180 slides in your gallery, and you will never go back to any of them. That's why we have people repeating our courses, because rather than concentrate, rather than pay attention, you want to snap all the slides. The, the, the explanations I'm making now are never contained in my slides. It's coming from my head. And I'm teaching you from what I know. You, except you are going to sit down recording, recording, then it means you're going to have hours of recording. The best you can do is to assimilate, understand, ask questions as the course is going on, and then go back to read whatever material you have. But if you come on the course and say, I'm going to snap all the slides, trust me, there's also going to be another free course on pharmacology. There's going to be other free courses on, on different aspects of the NCLEX. By the time we are done, you will have 2 million pictures in your gallery. And trust me, you are never going back to any of them. It will, go, it will tire you to even slide through the gallery. So again, I will advise, just pay attention and follow along. The content you will get, you will not get in your textbook. I'm speaking from experience, I'm speaking from knowledge, I'm speaking from the view of someone who has attended and done a real life NCLEX course. Okay, but again, while we're assessing this patient who has a pulseless ventricular tachycardia, like I said, we want to know if he has a pulse because the management is going to differ for someone who has a ventricular tachycardia and one who has a pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Again, remember we said it's a shockable rhythm. 
what do we do for this guy? What other things can we do for this guy? We need to carry out CPR. We need to give medications. We need to uh, shock and uh, all of what we'll do for a patient in cardiac arrest. Okay, so obviously number four is our correct option. Okay, let's look at another slide. A client with an implant adjuvator defibrillator developed. Okay, so this is another ventricular tachycardia. Again, you can see what I was mentioning. Now this guy has a ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. He has a ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. Now the ICD has fired multiple times without successfully stopping the ventricular tachycardia. Now the client has become confused and difficult to rouse. Now they are asking us which action by the nurse is appropriate. Again, it's all about in the stem of the question. Look at the stem of the question. What is the NCLEX telling you? What do we need to know about the stem? Yes, we know he has developed ventricular tachycardia, but look at this. He's confused and difficult to arouse. Again, would you say this client is stable or unstable? Okay, so Queen Esther, I don't know. I assume every other person is hearing me, but if you are not, it might be from your end. It might be from your end. So again, uh, okay. So again, I assume every other person is hearing me. So you might want to take your audio. Okay. So again, this client is confused and it's difficult to Client is unstable. Again, how do we manage? ventricular tachycardias. One, you want to confirm, does this guy have a pulse or he does not have a pulse? Again, we said if he doesn't have a pulse, it's a medical emergency. We need to carry out immediate uh, defibrillation, ventricular tachycardia without a pulse. But again, if the patient has a tachycardia and he is unstable, now they've told us the ICD has fired and it has failed and all of that, what do we need to do for this patient? We need to carry out synchronized cardioversion. Again, that is another management of a tachycardia because this patient has a pulse and he's unstable. So generally what I say is for unstable tachycardias, we need to carry out uh, synchronized uh, cardioversion. We can also try to carry out, okay, so for unstable tachycardias, immediately carry out synchronized cardioversion. There's no other alternative to it. The only options we could have used was if we said this client has a tachycardia and he's stable, he's not having any symptoms, he's hemodynamically stable, his, uh, his vitals are within range, but the only problem is that the heart rate is fast. Then we can carry out, for example, we can carry out vagal maneuvers. So what vagal maneuvers do you know? For example, we can carry out a carotid sinus massage. Again, remember on the NCLEX or in real world practice, you don't want to carry out massage of both carotid sinuses. So we want to do one at a time. So you can massage the carotid sinuses. You can uh, tell the guy to, uh, like the Vasava maneuver, tell them to bear down. You know, like do like you want to pull. And the person is there doing, mm. so when they are trying to pull, or, that's going to help to increase intrathoracic pressure and slow down the heart rate, slow down the vagus nerve. So that's what you want to do all. For children, remember with children with heart rates that are fast and they are stable, we can put cold compress on the forehead. So these are some little things you can do to slow down the heart rate. Again, remember we are only doing this if the client is stable. So I summarize again, for stable tachycardias, let's go ahead and carry out synchronized cardioversion. Synchronized cardioversion for unstable tachycardias. For tachycardias that are stable, we want to carry out vagal maneuvers. We said we can give, that uh, we can put cold compresses, uh, we can even give them a syringe and ask them to blow. We can ask them to blow back the plunger just to try to increase intrathoracic pressure. Again, when we talk about synchronized cardioversion, what are we trying to achieve? Okay, one minute. Okay, sorry, raise my pen. The pen is not working. Okay. So again, remember with synchronized cardioversion, it's almost the same thing as defibrillation. The only difference is that you must press the sync button on your defibrillator. 
So go on your defibrillator wherever you walk and look out for your sink button. So remember with defibrillation, you're going to charge, you press the shock button as defibrillation. But with synchronized cardioversion, you must press the sync button. So look out for questions like this on the NCLEX. Patient is having a tachycardia, uh, he's unstable and all of that. What is the first thing you want to do? You want to press the sync button. And when you press the sync button, what's going to happen? You're going to notice, you know, you look at the QRS complexes. And what are you going to see? You would notice what we call sync markers. So there are going to be sync markers that are going to be placed on the tips of the QRS complexes. So look out for that. When you press the sync button, make sure you have those sync markers that are on the tips of the QRS complexes. Because when you press the shock button, that's where you want to give up the shock. Because if you don't press the sync button, then you can shock at any other point of the cardiac cycle. And that can precipitate a ventricular fibrillation in your patient. So again, remember, I'm going to summarize again, for unstable tachycardia, go straight to synchronized cardioversion. It's an emergency. Press the sync button, charge the machine, and shock the hell out of the patient. That's for stable tachycardias. But for stable tachycardias, we'll also look at whether the complexes are narrow or wide. But generally, if they are stable, we can try carrying out um, vega maneuvers primarily to help to slow down the uh, heart rate. Okay, so the Beze, I hope I've explained the synchronized version. Uh, you said you want to press the sync button. So Patrick, rather than say I have a question, you can just drop the question so it's easier for me to just roll along. Okay. So then we synchronize cardioversion, make sure you press the sync button and then um, make sure the sync markers are there, charge the defibrillator and shock the patient. Okay, so that's with this. So what's our answer? Okay, so number four is our answer. Um, again, if we use those techniques we talked about, again, I'm just gonna throw it in here even though we have the correct answer. This would be, an implementation option, there's an implementation, there's an assessment, there's an implementation. Again, ask yourself, do I need to assess for that? Or do I need to do something for this patient? It's, it's as simple as that. Because the more you use those skills we talked about, those decision skills, uh, decision tree skills, it helps you to improve the chances that you get the correct answer. Because for example, now, I know confused, it's difficult to arouse. It's, it's not a good thing, it's, it's unstable meaning I do not need to assess for that. So I'm going to do my assessment option. And that leaves me with one, two, and four. So you can see that I have automatically increased the, my chances of getting the correct answer. So it was supposed to be, I can fail it. I had 25% ch uh, chance of failing it. But by removing one option, it has increased my chances of getting the correct answer. Okay, Patrick. Yeah, okay. So again, you want to use those techniques. I can go further with physical versus psychosocial, uh, ABCs and all of that. Because if I look at number number two, number two is it's not an ABC option. I can even remove that. Again, I'm left with only option one and four, which means I have 50% chance of getting this answer right. Even if I do tumbom tumbom now, hopefully God will help me, I pick number four. But again, you can see I've eliminated option two, I've eliminated option three. Sometimes, even without reading some questions on all these practice materials, I'm like, these guys, either they are joking or they don't know it's not, they didn't hide the answer well. Because even if I did not read this question, let me take away all of this. Let me take away all of this. And I come back to the option, even without reading this. Like I said, implementation, implementation, assessment, implementation. I know from my stem of the question, I know it's unstable, and take away this. And then, because I know number two is not an ABC option, I take away this. So automatically, I've not read the question, no, but at least I've, I've increased my chance of getting the correct answer, and I know it's between number one and number four. Again, I didn't even need to know what the topic is about, and I was able to uh, reduce the answers. Queen Esther, uh, repeating and typing that you're not having a sound, uh, I can't do anything from my end. You need to maybe log out and log back in again. Or you can go on YouTube, join on YouTube. There would be sound there. Go on Facebook. We are live on Facebook. You can also join from there. The only difference is you might not be able to uh, communicate because I can't take uh, questions from the YouTube channel and from the Facebook channel all at once. 
hopefully tomorrow Tony will be on ground to assist to take answers from all of those uh, uh, routes. Okay. Another question here. The nurse is monitoring a client following a radio frequency catheter ablation. The nurse knows that the P waves are now associated with the QRS complexes on the cardiac monitor. Which intervention is most appropriate? Again, um, you also want to remember on the NCLEX, what are your priorities? When they ask me which is most appropriate, documentation, come on, for Christ's sake. That's not like it. That, the, on, the only time documentation will be correct on the NCLEX is if I've done everything I need to do for this client. Again, documentation is psychosocial. Remember I said with the decision tree, you are using those, those, uh, those steps. Because if I group all of this into physical and psychosocial, I know documentation is psychosocial. Again, I've increased my chances of getting the correct answer. I have three options, but not four. But for you who's not using these techniques, you have four options to pick up with 25% chance of getting the answer right. But for me, I have the higher chance of three options to choose from. Again, look at the stem of what you want to focus on. What is the NCLEX trying to tell you? Why do we need to know that the waves are not Again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the course, I did not get one EC because the NCLEX is a begin. I would I call it a beginner or a, 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 an entry level exam? Nobody is asking you to take pathology for Christ's sake on the NCLEX. Nobody is asking you to take consultant for pathology for the NCLEX. They know you are an entry level nurse. Well, maybe you've been practicing all this while after two years or a BMH, you not remember you want to travel. They don't, the NCLEX doesn't know that. The NCLEX is still seeing you as an entry-level nurse. So when you go on reading, reading every uh, wolf species, um, a re-entry phenomenon, the, is you, even at the NCLEX, at a point, I was like, I thought they said, uh, if you are getting, if you are getting, if you are doing well on the NCLEX, you can do it all Man, the NCLEX, well, maybe because I've been doing for a while, again, at the point at number 60, I have to stop and say, man, make sure that you are not being confident. It will be a disaster. The NCLEX is not going to pay flight money. Well, nobody would have heard it. Uh, you only hear it. But again, you don't need to read and cover all the Everything you just keep going with those basics. Nobody expects you to know those difficult ECG readings. And all of that. You, you, just get, you just need to know, for example, heart blocks. What do I need to know regarding heart blocks? I just need to know my first degree heart block, my second degree type one and type two, and then my third degree heart block. Because if I know only these three, I know that this is the only that's a basic standard definition for a third degree heart block. The P waves are not associated with QRS complexes because you are going to see AV nodal dissociation. The atriums will be firing themselves, the ventricles will be firing at a slower intrinsic rate. That's why you see that for every P waves, we already have uh, we have two P waves and we have one QRS complex. So the P waves are firing at their own rate. QRS complexes would always fire at a slower rate. And that's why it's called a complete heart block. Because if this is a heart, normally, so I didn't want to go into cardiac anatomy, but again, we know that the impulse should come from the AV node, to the, sorry, from the SA node to the AV node, and into the bond of the branches, and then into the OPG fibers. But what's happening with third degree heart block? Or what's happening with most of this block? Well, with third degree heart block, there's a complete block. That's why they call it AV node out association. The impulse doesn't go. Then Esther, you are you are you are, you are really distracting me. Every time I need to uh, fall back to look at the charts to know if I have a question, please you can uh, go back to go on YouTube and join or go on Facebook if you are having issues with your sound. Remember when you when you log in, you need to click on the when you log in. Okay, I can't see it from here, but again, you need to click on the audio icon. Then if you don't enable it, then you are going to be 
having issues with your sound. Please don't bring me back to have to distract me to check on your messages again. I can't do anything from my end. Okay, so Patrick, you are right. Um, I don't know which you are referring to. Okay, this looks like a bradycardia. Okay, transcutaneous pacing is a better option. Okay, yeah, we already did that. Okay, so again, just like Patrick said, most times you don't even need to uh, know ECG, be a perfect uh, analytic uh, person. I'm barely looking at an ECG script. You should be able to say, is this reading fast or is this reading slow? Do I have a cardia or do I have a cardia? Well, tomorrow we'll look at how to identify uh, cardias and cardia and all of that. Again, just by looking at so this is our arrow wave and this is our arrow wave. Just by looking at the arrow interval, look at the distance between them. That tells me this reading is fast. Now look at the arrow interval. Look at how close cool that is. That tells me it's probably a, a, fast, a faster reading than the last one. So you want to look at first glance what is before me. Does this reading look fast or does this reading look slow? I'm not sure why you can't hear me. <sighs> Your mic is not loud. Your mic is not loud. Ah. And my voice is cracking. Honestly, my voice will be cracking because I had like ACLS training the whole of today. I barely came in and had to start this class. So I don't know if it's the network or my voice is actually cracking. So I won't be surprised if it's cracking. I hope, is, is it better now? I've had to change my position. Okay, so one person says it's better now. Okay. Okay, so again, we said, just by merely looking at, looking at the ECG, you want to you can identify if it is fast or if it is slow. So again, I already know this is a bradycardic rhythm. And again, from the stem of the question, they tell us, that the P waves are not associated with our QRS complex. Again, what do we need to do for this patient? The heart rate is too slow. We want to carry out pacing. It could either be transcutaneous pacing or intravenous pacing, but again, we want to notify the cardiologist and we want to prepare for temporary pacing. So that's our correct answer. Number four would be our correct answer. Sorry, because of time, I may not be able to give you the rationales while these other ones are, are wrong. But again, we, we don't want to begin chest compression on a client who has uh, a rhythm that is slow. He has he probably has a pulse. We want to carry out chest compression. So number one would be wrong. Again, you want to take note of this on the NCLEX. There are only three categories that will require you to carry out chest compression on your patient. One, the patient is going to be unresponsive. So you, you call out to him, he's not responding. Number two, you check for a carotid pulse, he doesn't have a pulse. And number three, he's not going to be breathing. So look out for breathing, look out for chest rise. If Again, if you see what we call agonal gapses, um, so you kind of hear him doing, <gasps> so <clears throat> those are agonal gapses, those are not effective breathing. Again, that would not, uh, that would not be effective breathing. So if three of these are, if you see three of these uh, findings in your patient, you want to start chest compression. So again, we're not going to carry out chest compression in a client who has a slow heart rate. Again, cardiovascular. What do we do with cardiovascular? We already talked about cardiovascular when we called it synchronized cardiovascular. And where did we say we are going to use synchronized cardiovascular? I thought we had something on cardiovascular. Okay, yeah, so we talked about synchronized cardiovascular where we said we want to um, press the sync button and look at it, pick out the tip of the QRS complex. And we said we use this for patients who are uh, having uh, unstable tachycardias. So again, you want to know what each of these electrical therapy is used for. So we said if the patient is in cardiac arrest, one way I used to remember this is if he, if he is in VFib, you defib. Vfib, defib. If your patient is in Vfib, you defib. So Vfib will mean your ventricular fibrillation. Defib will mean your defibrillation. So if the client is in ventricular fibrillation, if he is in Vfib, you carry out defib. So again, not just VTAC with the pulse, for unstable VTAC. 
probably yes, we want to carry out synchronized cardioversion. And again, so number two would be wrong. We won't carry out synchronized cardioversion for a slow rhythm, for a bradycardic rhythm. We want to carry out synchronized cardioversion for a uh, for an unstable tachycardia. Again, just for those who might be suffering themselves to record and take pictures, the 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 the, the, the class is already recorded, so it's going to be posted on the YouTube channel after this. So please, you you're you're welcome to go back and um uh and rewatch uh, re the videos again uh just to assimilate better. Okay, already we used our decision tree analogy to take off. Which one is? This is not for beginners. I'm not understanding. It's too early because I'm I'm actually just on the top slide, so it's too early for you. See now we've not even gone anywhere, and Kumilola is not. So again, you can rather than say you are not understanding, you can actually uh, point me to where we've lost you. Because we are just on the third slide. We've not even gone anywhere. So it's too early to lose anybody at this point. So what we are exactly, and again, remember Fumilola, uh, the, the class is not progressing uh, with, diff, with uh, specific topics. So I'm dealing with each question as they come. So you can see now we've talked about cardiac arrest in option one. We've talked about unstable tachycardia in number two. We've talked about using decision tree, uh, physical versus psychosocial in number three. And then we've talked about pacing for uh, heart blocks. So again, don't, don't try to model all of them. Just look at each question. Uh, try to understand each question as it comes. OK, so again, I'm actually my time uh, because I just want us to see. I want to see how much we can cover today. I'm actually exhausted tomorrow. Um, I still have my classes, the PLS class and the SLS class on Monday. Uh, so we'll still try to push as much as possible. Okay, so let's look at another question. Um, so this says a nurse on the telemetry unit observes the following reading on the monitor if a client admitted with a coronary artery disease, which action should the nurse take first? So again, if you have your writing materials, I want you to take note of this on the NCLEG. So you're going to see... We'll talk about it tomorrow, but again, the, 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 what I'm trying to do here is to run down all these answers so that when we now start talking about it on the main course, uh, you will remember that, yes, I saw this question, and then you can still go back to retake the quiz, and hopefully everything pans out good. So again, I'm going to try to give us uh, what a normal ECG strip should look like. So again, it's going to be our P wave. This is our QRS complex. So this is my Q, R, S, T. Uh, so that's my P, Q, R, S, T. So this is what your normal uh, ECG reading should look like. But this is where I want you, this is where I want you to focus on. Okay, so again, uh, Patrick, you, says that this, you said there's a missed beat. So your answer should be number four. Like I say, um, <laughs> some of these questions are not real questions. I, I, I can swear on my life that this, either the people setting these questions don't know how to hide answers or they are just playing with us because I don't even need to read this. I'm always going to carry out an assessment. So now I don't even know what the options are. I just categorize them as assessments and implementations. I'm going to carry out assessment. There's no way number two is not my answer. I need to know what the client's vital signs are. Again, this would be another slow reading. This would be a second degree AV block. This would be a second degree AV block type one. But again, let me, Patrick, so just hold on. Uh, because when I see chats, I feel it's a question and I have to rush through. So I'm going to take out this again. And let's, let me not lose out what I'm trying, the point I was trying to make. So let's still take it one after the other. So again, that is your, so this is what we are trying to, so this is what a normal should look like. But again, there's a point I want you to focus on, on the NCLEX, this flat, flat area here. Remember, how do you name your waves and your segment? We already have our waves as P wave, Q wave, R wave, S wave, T waves. For segments, segments are named by the 
uh, waves that border them on the left and the right side. For example, we have our S wave here. We have our T wave here. So this particular place that is flat is called our ST segment. That's our ST segment. And you can see it's flat. So again, what I want you to know as regards the NCLEX is whenever you see or they mention that our ST segment is elevated, what does that tell you? So again, this is my P wave. This is my Q wave. This is my arrow wave. And somewhere here is my T wave. So what happened to this flat part? You can see it's elevated. Whenever I see ST segment elevation, I'm already thinking about myocardial infarction. That's actually why it's called a STEMI, S-T-E-M-I. So it's called a STEMI. So please remember that on the NCLEX. Whenever you see ST segment elevation on the on your question, you should already start thinking about um, myocardial infarction. There's a coronary occlusion. That's why we are seeing ST. They will tell you that uh, the, the, the nurse has reported seeing ST segment elevation on uh, V1, V2, V3, V4. That tells me that's classic MI. Because once I see ST segment elevation in numerically consecutive leads, V1 followed by V2, followed by V3, followed, that's, so that's numerical. They are following each other. So if I see ST segment elevation in numerically, in numerically consecutive leads, that tells me this client is having an MI. So even though that's not related to the question, but I just wanted us to, I just saw this coronary artery disease and I just felt I should bring it in. So again, with coronary artery disease, look out for ST segment elevation because if I see ST segment elevation, that tells me my client is possibly having uh, uh, a myocardial infarction. So again, let's go back to our question again. So just permit me, I'll be digressing trying to touch on any important part I need, I think you need to know. Um, so again, uh, let's go back to our question. The client has a history of coronary, he's admitted with coronary artery disease, and we see this reading. Again, what does this reading tell us? Like I mentioned, it's a second degree AV block. Remember your second degree blocks have type one and type two. So again, when do we need to intervene? Most times, well, obviously for our first degree, most times it is benign. We might not need to do anything. But with your second degree AV block, we need to ask ourselves, are there signs of hemodynamic instability in this client? Let's get the vital signs. What's the SpO2? What's the blood pressure? Is he complaining of shortness of breath? Is he complaining of dizziness? Are there signs of ischemic uh, heart uh, failure? Are there signs of shock? That will now determine if we need to go further. Again, like I said, these people just came up here and told you, see how to read. What should you do? My brother, the first thing you should do as a nurse is always to carry out your assessment. We don't even need to know whether this is first degree or, like I said, these people, are, they don't set real questions. And please, for those who are thinking now, the source of question, I pay for Kaplan, I pay for UWorld, I pay for Archers, and then I pick RHT questions. I pick questions that I feel are difficult, and then I use them as my study materials. Uh, well, apologies to all of these uh, bodies that are taking their effort to draft this question. But again, I pay, and then I can assess all of the high quality uh, uh, questions that I can use on my courses. So again, like I said, I didn't even need to know uh, if this is a first degree or a second. We'll, we'll look at all of these hard blocks on the core content course. But again, just by using my decision tree, I know that, man, this guy, I need to assess because when I assess, it will tell me if this patient is able or unable uh, and all of that. Yes, you don't want to confuse this because they would always give you answers that uh, look correct. Because I know that your first line management for symptomatic bradycardias is usually going to be if atropine. But again, we said we're using atropine for symptomatic bradycardias. Do we know if this patient is having symptoms? We don't. The only way we can find out is to assess. So again, number one is obviously going to be wrong. Move the client from here. Well, I don't even know what that is. Give up to We need to know if this client is unstable. 
Because if it's unstable, yes, we can carry out this, uh, put a pacemaker, blah, blah, blah. Again, let's do the first things first. Always tell yourself, if my child hits his, head on, his leg on the, uh, on the phone, am I going to hit my leg? Am I going to carry out assessment? Let me see your leg. We are examining it. What did you hit it against? That's your nursing assessment. You do that every day. I tell people, if you want to write the NCLEX, all your life has to be about the NCLEX. So again, I apply the NCLEX. If you look at my, uh, my, my, okay, I don't know, for those who attended, how do I memorize all of my lab values? I put them into my routine. Whenever, whenever I eat banana, I tell myself, ah, I'm going to get potassium from this banana. Okay, I know bananas, they come in five. Although Tinubu's era now, they are not even coming complete. But before they come, either you have the three, there are some that are three, they sell 100 naira. And then the ones that, are, that come in five uh, fingers, those ones are 500 naira. So sometimes I buy the five finger own and the 100 naira and 500 naira. Own. So that reminds me that my potassium level should be between three and five. Again, when I can remember three and five, I know it's 3.5 to five. So again, that's how I try to remember those lab values because you need to know them. You need to go into the hall knowing those lab values. I think about creatinine. Ah, creatinine, no. how am I going to remember creatinine? And I tell myself, creatinine, create. And it's true, God created this world from nothing. And it took him seven days. Nothing meaning zero. It took him seven days. So I know that my start for creatinine is 0 0.7. Once I can remember that, I now know that, okay, the ending is just to double that seven, which is 1.4. So again, 0 0.7 to 1.4. So whenever I see creatinine, I'm already thinking of create, create. Ah, okay, I remember I used God. God created the earth in, from zero to, and then you need to make everything about you, everything about you, about the NCLEX. Leave the NCLEX. Any lab values you are struggling with, paste it on your wardrobe or paste it on your mirror. Whenever you are brushing your hair, whenever you are putting on that, your Brazilian wig, you're looking at the lab values and you are memorizing it. There's no way you're going to do this every day till the day of your exam. You will know the core lab values you need to know. Again, I repeat, you don't need to know everything. You just need to identify those core lab values you need to know. And that is enough to uh, take you past the finish line on your test day. Okay, so let's look at another question again. A client has been defibrillated at 360 joules, well, for a monophasic defibrillator, but again, this monophasic are being phased out, uh, so we are using more of biphasic uh, defibrillators now. Man, uh, Patrick, I'm not sure how else I can help with my mic. I don't have an earpiece or a microphone. Maybe I'll need to get one, but I, I don't really do these courses. Uh, frequently, so I've not thought of getting one, but maybe I'll look look out for a mic, but just maybe manage the, the sound as it is for for this night. So a client has been defibrillated at 360 joules, and the attempts to convert the VF were unsuccessful. Okay, so as regards ventricular fibrillation, so here is how I start my ACLS classes. I tell people the we use the ECG for what? And then they respond and tell me, we use ECG to record electrical activities in the heart. So if, if, the electric, if, there, if there's electrical activity ongoing in the heart, then the ECG is going to start drawing for us on the graph paper. So we're not going to, we're not going to go into the origins of our P wave, QRS complex and T wave. Maybe we'll do that on the core content course. But again, ask yourself, if this ECG is supposed to record electrical activity, if there's no electrical activity, what do you think is going to happen to the ECG? What kind of graph is it going to draw? It's not going to draw anything. It's, got, it's just going to remain on the isoelectric line because it's not detecting any electrical activity. Now, what do we call this isoelectric line, this flat line that the ECG is telling us? That's what we call AC stove. So again, that's one ECG reading you need to know going into the ECLEX. That's asystole. Again, what is asystole? A is a prefix for absent. Systole means contraction. So obviously the ECG is telling you, brother, my sister, there's absent contraction. Again, remember, it's not seeing any electrical activity. And that's why it's telling you there's no contraction because it is that electrical activity that translates to mechanical contraction of the heart. So if there's no electrical activity, Probably or obviously, this patient doesn't even have a pulse. Again, what do you need to know about ACE stole on the NCLEX? 
this is a non-shockable reading. Please, if you are planning to write the NCLEX, stop watching Nigerian movies. Because in Nigerian movies, the actor is going to die, and then they, you see it on the ECG, we'll do, you see that flat line. And then the doctor will come out, and then they will use a defibrillator, and they will charge it, and they will shock him. They will charge it, you know, actor now. Wow. When they charge it, shock him, charge it, shock him, before you know what happens, actor will stand up again. That's not feasible. That's not real life practice. So again, keep off those kind of movies. Rather, you want to watch those medical series like Dr. House, um, all of this, uh, what was this other one? There are so many of these medical series. And the good thing about some of these medical series is that you, you they actually use real life hospitals. They, they talk about real life medical cases. So you learn a lot from them. I remember when I wrote the CGFNS 15 years back, that was when I, I got information about, I can't remember what it was, but it was a, a disease condition that was transmitted through bats. And that was my first time of hearing it. And again, that helped me when I wrote the CGFNS like 15 decades ago. So that's what you want to do to get yourself in tune with the NCLEX. Because I tell people, you want to write IELTS and you're still watching Aki and Popo. What do you plan to gain from that? Change the channel to BBC. Change your movies to foreign movies so that when they talk super, 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 you hear what they're saying. Me, I'm here trying to do super, super for people that are abroad, that have joined. But again, that's my accent. Uh, well, so if you are planning to write the end place, start watching those medical series. Start watching movies. Listen to BBC. Improve on your knowledge. Practice yourself. For example, I know people who will be out there, they are ready to throw their money. Once you say pay for easy, they will pay. It's not about paying. What have you done on your own to help yourself to build up on your skills? For example, the ILTS. Don't rush in, go to pay someone to tutor you. There are so many videos on YouTube you can use to practice. There are so many YouTube that has practice sessions because you can see it, you are not doing well on those practice sessions. Why do you think on the exam day where there's going to be tension, anxiety, you're going to go there and do very well? It's impossible. So get the foundation, get the basics, and then you can go on to build on that. Maybe if you are still not comfortable, you can get someone and pay and say, okay, tutor me on that. But don't that be the first step to start jumping out. You've not even opened any of these study materials. You've not paid for any uh, Q bank. The first thing you want to do is pay someone to start coaching you. No, what have you done to build the foundation? And then you can grow up from there. Again, if you don't wake up and say, ah, Nkechi has traveled, Choma has traveled, Jesse has traveled, that's now that's when you remember you want to write 10 clicks. So I tell people, you are working in the world. Every day, your patient does ECG. You go to the room where they did the ECG, you collect the ECG, you give it to the doctor. Another patient does ECG. You go there, collect the ECG paper, you give it to the doctor. For 18 years, you've been doing the same thing. Picking ECG paper and giving to the doctor. For one day, you've not said, I want to even look at what is on this ECG. And then you've woken up today to come and say, you want to attend this ECG class and become a consultant. It's not possible. So every day at work is a day to learn new information, that would be instructive towards you passing the NCLEX. So again, we were talking about cases before I digress. So let's go back. What other reading? So now there's no electrical activity. The ECG remains on the isoelectric line. So let's assume the heart is fibrillating. Now, when the heart is fibrillating, what actually happens? So again, this is going to be the patient's heart. So we have our atria on top, our ventricles below. What is happening with fibrillation? Multiple ectopic foci are firing at the same time within the ventricles. Multiple ectopic foci are firing within the ventricle. And what is that going to do? It's going to confuse the ECG. Remember, we said the ECG records electrical activity in the heart. So it's going to try and attempt to record all of these ectopic fires that is going on in the vent. And what are you going to have on the ECG? You're going to have this chaotic uh, rhythm on the ECG because, sorry, my pen is messing up, because the ECG cannot keep up with all of those abnormal firings within the ventricle. And that's what we refer to as ventricular fibrillation, because the ventricles are firing abnormally, and the ECG is trying to record that. And that's your ventricular fibrillation. Again, remember, we already talked about this, and we said your, um, we said Sorry, I've missed my thoughts. Okay, so we said for ventricular fibrillation, the first thing you want to do is defibrillate this patient. Remember, the patient prognosis improves with early defibrillation, early CPR. So let's get the 
AED or your manual defibrillator, let's shock this patient, let's get, um, uh, let's start CPR, let's give those medications we need to give to resuscitate this patient. So again, now we've covered two basic rhythms. We've covered AC stool, which we said is a non-shockable rhythm, and now we've covered uh, ventricular fibrillation, which we said is a shockable rhythm. Which other rhythm did we say is shockable? We talked about, we talked about ventricular tachycardia, not just ventricular tachycardia. We said if a patient presents in pulseless ventricular tachycardia, then that is a shockable rhythm. So again, if the patient presents with pulseless ventricular tachycardia, that is a shockable rhythm. Okay, so let me just let, I still have like 10 people who are trying to join the class, even though they are joining late, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm fatigued. So we're just gonna go for another 10, 15 minutes and then we'll call it a day to reconvene tomorrow. Okay, so again, we said, the client has been defibrillated. He had a ventricular fibrillation. It was unsuccessful. Based on an evaluation of the situation, the nurse determines that which action is best. Which action is best? So again, if we shock and it wasn't successful, do we need to terminate our resuscitation effort? No, because it could be a recurrent ventricular fibrillation. So rather, we we'll still need to continue uh, um, our CPR will still need to shock. Again, remember, when do we give our epinephrine? We want to take this note down for the NCLEX. We want to give epinephrine after the second shock. We want to give epinephrine after the second shock. Again, if we give the third shock, which other medication can we give? We can give amiodarone. Again, you also want to take this down. For amiodarone, we want to give 300 milligram. And if we need to repeat it, we can give lidocaine. So again, you want to remember, uh, lidocaine was taken off the algorithm previously, but again, it has been added back by the AHA based on the 2020 guidelines. So we have the option of either using lidocaine at 300 milligram, or we can use uh, a lidocaine at um, uh, one milligram per kg. So again, Patrick, uh, I'm not going to mention procainamide because I personally go with the AHA uh, guidelines. And with the AHA guidelines, our core medications on the AHA ACLS algorithm would be epinephrine after the second shock, um, lidocaine or amiodarone after the third shock. Again, if we use lidocaine and AHA would be at the American Heart Association. Okay, so if we use lidocaine, uh, initially, it doesn't work at that one milligram per kg, or we use amiodarone, it doesn't work. We can repeat at a lesser dose. So again, the first dose of uh, amiodarone would be 300 milligram. If we need to repeat, we'll use 150 milligram. So again, if you have used lidocaine at one milligram per kg, although the textbook says one to one and a half milligram per kg, but that confuses me a lot. So I just prefer sticking to the one milligram. So if I use lidocaine one milligram per kg, maybe the guy is 70 kg. So I'm going to give him 70 milligram. So again, if I give 70 milligram, it doesn't work. I can repeat that half that dose, which would be 0 0.5 milligram per kg. So that would be like 35 milligram subsequently. Okay. So again, uh, with this, do we need to administer sodium bicarbonate? Well, um, that would not be our initial action after we carry out an unsuccessful deflation. So again, remember this for the NCLEX. No matter how the story, how they turn the story, immediately you shock, resume CPR. Again, I can't repeat this enough. Shock, CPR. If I shock, I resume CPR. If I shock, I resume CPR. If they tell me the story, blah, 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 they've tried the first shock, blah, blah, blah. They, have, they must resume CPR. That's the standard. So don't allow them... Uh, and confuse you. Always remember that once you have delivered a shock, you want to resume CPR. Uh, we can't go into this, but again, I would have loved to mention some other things. But again, let's not go too far. Okay, so again, we won't be administering sodium bicarbonate. We can, if while CPR is going on, we can decide to treat those reversible causes that could have precipitated this client to be in a cardiac arrest. What are those uh, reversible causes? We are referring to the H's and our H's and T's, our five H's and our five T's. So we can now start to treat these. 
Remember, so, uh, one of them would be acidosis. So that's where the sodium bicarbonate can come in. So again, how do you want to manage acidosis? Think about it. Is it a respiratory acidosis or is it a metabolic acidosis? Again, you must know your arterial blood gas. I wish I had time. I would have loved to break arterial blood gas analysis right here. But again, that would move us out of the ECG entirely. But again, you want to go back and know your arterial blood gases, starting with your pH. What should be your normal pH? Again, what of our PCO2, our HCO3? Again, how do we need to manage this? So if it's a metabolic acidosis, well, we can give our sodium bicarbonate, but if it's a respiratory acidosis, then we can properly ventilate this client because he's retaining excess CO2. That's why he's going into respiratory acidosis. So we need to properly ventilate him to push out all of those uh, excessive CO2 to stabilize his uh, uh, ABG level. So again, I can't go into acidosis at the moment, but again, this option would be wrong. And option three would be our correct answer. We'll need to resume CPR for five cycles or about two minutes. So this would be our correct answer. Number four would be wrong. Again, this is where I reference the AHA. Initially, they used to tell us uh, multiple uh, shocks in successive uh, sequence. But again, they took that out. And now we only deliver one shock and resume CPR. So this would have been right maybe donkeys of years ago defibrillating three more times, but no, uh, we'll need to resume CPR for five cycles. And again, if I ever wanted to use my ABC options, uh, all of these will be non-ABCs. These are non-ABCs. It's only this one now that has to deal with circulation. So again, I don't want to look so like I'm bragging, but again, I can tell you I will read this question without, I will, read, I will solve this question without even reading the question because I know this is the only option that has to do with circulation, and that's my correct option. Okay, so let's look at one last question before we call it a day. My voice is almost drying out. A nurse is in the ICU. A nurse in the ICU is interpreting a client's cardiac reading. Which reading should a nurse document? Okay, so again, uh, we talked about pacemakers. Uh, for example, what are your pacemakers? Why do we use pacemakers? Uh, there are times you might be maybe I'm walking on the street with my son and he's walking slowly. If I just tap him on the bum bum, what happens? He starts to walk faster. That's what we use our pacemaker for. The heart rate, so it wouldn't be hypertension, the heart rate is slow. That's why we want to pace the heart, to increase the heart rate. That's why you use your pacemaker. Again, you can decide to have a, um, an atrial pacemaker or a ventricular pacemaker. Again, how do you know which the patient has? It depends on where you can see our PESA spikes. Those are your PESA spikes there. Just right in front of our QRS complexes. Those are your PESA spikes. That tells me this is a ventricular rhythm because my PESA spikes are right in front of my QRS complexes. If I had my P waves, so let me, let me just put on the P waves. I didn't, I didn't put the pacemaker, the QRS complex. So if I had this as my P waves and I had my pacer spikes here, what does that tell me? Tells me this is an atrial based rhythm. So again, this is a very simple one. Uh, I was surprised everybody was missing it or majority of the people missed it. But again, it's just looking out. So this is my P wave here. If I had these pacer spikes here and not here, I would have said this is a, an atrial based rhythm. But again, this would be a ventricular pace rhythm based on where we have our PESA spikes. It cannot be a, it cannot be atrial flutter because I know that whenever I go into the kitchen to cut bread, I use my bread knife. And every time I just use that bread knife, I will turn the bread knife and I will laugh. I say, hey, see atrial flutter. That's how I remember my atrial flutter because I'm going to see those flutter waves. Sorry, my pen is horrible. And then I'm going to see a narrow QRS complex. Then I see that bread knife pattern again. Sorry. So I'm going to see those bread knife pattern again. And then I will see a narrow QRS complex. And then I see those sawtooth. Sorry. I see those sawtooth pattern again. And I, I also see my, uh, I see my narrow QRS complexes. That is my atrial flutter. The atrials are fluttering. That's why instead of having just one P wave here, we are having the atrials fluttering. 
Again, when we talk of flutter, it means the areas are beaten at a fast rate. But in the end, what happens? Even though you have multiple areas that are firing at the same time, only one impulse is going to go into the ventricle. And that's why we are having a narrow QRS complex. And then the atrials begin to flood again. Then you have a narrow QRS complex. Again, look at the our RR interval, the spaces between the RR interval. You see that they are evenly spaced out. That's also another thing that tells me this is atrial flutter because it, it looks like a regular rhythm. The rhythm looks regular. The QRS complex look narrow, which is what we want it to be. And then we see those sawtooth pattern or our bread knife pattern. So this would be atrial flutter. So it can't be an atrial fibrillation because, uh, Patrick, it won't be an atrial fibrillation because we, won't, we don't have those. Uh, in, in, in atrial fibrillation, um, they would be more rounded and, uh, than what you have here. So again, this would be atrial flutter. With atrial fibrillation, you and my pen is really horrible. So you see those fibrillate. We call these ones fibrillatory waves. So you you see those fibrillatory waves, and then we'll still see our narrow QRS complex. But this time around, they are going to be evenly spaced out. Sorry, they are going to be irregular. So that's the difference between um, um, atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. So again, with atrial flutter, you see sawtooth bread knife pattern. With atrial uh, fibrillation, you see those fibrillatory waves before the QRS complex. Again, if you look at our RR intervals, our RR intervals on atrial flutters are always, almost always going to be even. But on atrial fibrillation, they will be unevenly spaced out. It will be irregular. Okay. Again, it can be a ventricular bigeminy. Don't mind these guys and their big words. What's a ventricular bigeminy? So you have your B wave. We have our narrow QRS complex, and then by Germany, by means two. So it means for, 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 how do I explain it now? For the next one, so you see a normal P wave QRS complex, and then the next wave will now have maybe a wide QRS complex, and then the next wave goes back to a normal QRS complex. The next one now, we run mad again and have a, huh? a pen is running haywire. So again, uh, and I should have just had the rhythms drawn uh, prepared. <sighs> okay, so again, we said the next rhythm, the, but the, the second rhythm is always going to be different. And then it goes back to a normal rhythm again. And then the next one is going to be wide. So that's your bigeminy. Why are they calling it ventricular? Because the QRS complex are wide. Again, remember, whenever you see wide QRS complexes, it tells you that the impulse is of ventricular origin. The impulse is coming from the ventricles. So that tells me it's a vidricular, uh, whatever vidricular, ventricular by Germany. Again, you would also see, is, is it vidric, ventricular tri Germany? It's just big, big grammar. It's the same thing. But this time around, tri means three. So you have a normal one, you will have another normal one, and then the third one will run mad. And then it goes back again. Normal, normal, oh. Sorry, normal, and the third one goes haywire again. That's your ventricular trigeminy. So don't mind the big words. It's just to understand what they are trying to tell you, what, what is, that there's a ventricular origin, and you are having it after the third uh, kind of time. Okay, so number three is our correct answer. And then we already talked about ventricular tachycardia. So again, with ventricular tachycardia, just to mop it all up, you're going to see a rhythm that is fast. So let me just draw this. I'm struggling with my pen. I need to get like something I can write with instead of my mouse. So again, you're going to, oh, sorry. Okay, so you're going to see, so we're going to see wide complexes and they're going to be close to each other. Again, I said most times you can just look at the rhythm. Just by looking at the RR interval will tell you if the rhythm is fast or slow. Look at the RR interval. See how close these two are together. See how close these two are together. Again, if they are close together and I believe the rhythm is fast, I call it a tachycardia. Now, which kind of tachycardia am I going to grade it as? Look at the QRS complexes. Remember, 
the impulse follows the normal conduction pathway of the heart. If the impulse followed came from the SA node and moved to the AV node and then to the bundle branches and then to the change fibers, then our QRS complexes are going to be narrow. But if the impulse is coming from within the ventricles, then our QRS complex is going to be wide. So if we say this is a tachycardia, look at our QRS complexes. They are all wide. That tells me this is of ventricular origin. This is a ventricular tachycardia. So again, we do not have that here. Number four would also be wrong. Okay, so I'm going to grave your indulgence. And I said we are going to go for another 10, 15 minutes, but we've gone for another 30 minutes. Um, uh, we'll, we'll continue tomorrow um, as scheduled. Um, unfortunately, we didn't cover much of what I wanted to cover. Uh, we didn't even go like, we still have a long way to go. Uh, but okay, it's still no problem. We'll still, we'll, we'll resume tomorrow, uh, same time, 7.15, just so that I have like 15 minutes to to settle in. Um, again, we'll resume tomorrow, same time. Please tell your colleagues, if you know friends who are trying to ride the NCLEX, they are struggling with the ECG, uh, they are welcome to join the class for tomorrow. Again, if you cannot join us on Zoom, you can always join on YouTube and Facebook. Um, uh, so again, I'm just going to have ask you, grave your indulgence. Please, if you have any questions, just write them down. Save them till tomorrow, please. When we come back on the course, uh, before we go into the content for tomorrow, we still have a lot to cover. We can take those questions so I can I can rest my, my, my throat. So again, I want to say thank you, everybody, for joining. And do have a good night's rest. Thank you very much.